Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Monica Girth. Now, um, she's leading the research group in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Otago, and her research is focusing on molecular mechanisms that underpin microbial behaviours, such as how microbes smell, that's not how they actually, yeah, how they sense, and how they move and cause infections. This was on her bio. I just wanted to read that out because it was really interesting to me. Um, with that, I'll leave you with Dr. Monica Girth. Thank you. They do actually smell, often quite bad. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation today. I think it's really an honor to be able to come talk about our research. Um, so my area is that I'm going to talk about today is about carry dieback disease. And I guess from a personal point of view, how as a Western trained scientist, I think, or at least I hope we can contribute to this problem, but also where I think the limitations of our approach are and why Mataronga Māori is actually really important to our research. And so I don't think this needs much introduction to this crowd, but obviously cowry dieback disease is killing the cowry trees here in New Zealand. Uh, it infects trees of all ages. It kills them, and it's caused by an organism called Phytophthora agathodicida, um, formerly known as PTA. And Phytophthora actually, just for a bit of background, it's actually been around for quite a long time and it's known to infect other plants. So globally, it's completely devastated ecosystems around the world. It's had a huge human cost. It's what's caused the Irish potato famine back in the 1800s. And there really aren't enough options for controlling this disease. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit to do with, I guess, alternative approaches. And one of the ways that we're trying to think about this is instead of focusing on one part of its life cycle, about trying to target it in lots of different areas. So Phytophthora, they look like, in, when we first grow them in the lab, they look kind of like a bread mold. They look like a fungus. And that's actually what people thought it was originally. But they actually have this really complex lifestyle where they go from this thing we call the mycelium, which is the fungal mat. They produce spores, which pop open. The spores come out into the environment and they can swim through waterlogged soils, and that's how they get to the next plant. And it was really interesting, the talk um, from Sandy this morning. These spores um, aren't just wandering around the environment randomly. They're actually seeking out their hosts, and that's a really big part of my research. Um, but to start with, I guess the first thing we've been trying to do is just looking at this first growth stage. And what I'm showing you on your left is a mycelial mat growing in the lab, as it would normally. And what we're doing right now, is, what we have been doing, is trying to screen for compounds that can inhibit this first stage. And so on the plate on the right, we've got, this is just water, and these are chemicals at four different concentrations. And what you can see is that if we find something that inhibits the growth, you see this zone of clearance and what's growing towards the water control ha quite happily. And then once we find hits from this, and we can also move on to other life cycle stages. I don't know if you can start the other movie. Um, so here is a picture of the spores swimming. So we can add the same chemical and look for disruption of motility so the spores can't move around to the next plant anymore. And we're also looking, we test the same compounds to see if they can prevent germination. So once a spore finds a cowrie tree root, it insists on the root and it sends out this long uh, tube. And that's actually how it penetrates into the plant and causes the infection. So what we're trying to do with existing tools is find chemicals that can actually stop all of these phases. And so I guess the first part of our project originally was just trying to take things that people have already found and repurpose them. And we've screened about 500 compounds at this point, and we've got a, a handful of, I guess, compounds that we think are promising. But this is, I guess, where in my talk I get to the limitation um, side of things. I feel like in, at least in my training, um, our approach is often to just kill things. Um, you know, if you've, got, uh, if you've got a bacterial infection, you give it an antibiotic, but of course lo lots of you would know if you take an antibiotic, you wipe out everything. You wipe out the good bugs, you wipe out the bad bugs, um, but it's often the way we sort of think about this. And so there's lots of limitations to this approach, even though I hope, I hope what we found can be useful in the short term as sort of a band-aid fix until we can find something a little bit more holistic. But you know, some of these compounds will be expensive, some of them will be toxic. Um, either to the environment or to the plant. They can be disruptive to an ecosystem. And bacteria and microbes like Phytophthora are really good at developing resistance to whatever we throw at them. So it becomes sort of a futile arms race in many ways. And I guess and this gets to the next part, which is, I guess, my crazy idea. So 
I was thinking an alternative target would be to target the zoospores. So these zoospores are the most important part of actually spreading cowrie dieback disease in forests. And this is just a video of one sort of bud releasing the spores. So each of these buds, what's called a sporangia, will hold about 30 of these spores. Um, you can have in something about the size of my fingernail, you could have hundreds to thousands of these buds, each one giving out 30 or more spores. And these are what can swim through and find the next tree. And so what we were thinking is, how are they finding the trees, basically? And lots of microbes use a process called chemotaxis. And it's much the same process you guys would have used to find lunch this afternoon. Um, so it's the directed movement towards or away from chemicals in the environment. So we tend to move towards things that we like to eat. We tend to move away from things that smell bad. And this is an example of chemotaxis. With just you can see, there's a cell. And there's a researcher moving a syringe around that has something it likes, so it's chasing it around. Um, it's not Phytophthora, but I think it's the, one of the nicest examples of chemotaxis. Um, and this actually came out of some of my other work. We work a lot on the kiwifruit pathogen as well, which is PSA. And PSA gets into, this is a leaf surface. And in order for PSA to infect a kiwifruit plant, it either has to get in through a leaf hole, like a stomata or a wound. And it actually, we've been studying how it finds it on a leaf surface or in the environment, how it navigates across and gets into the hole. And we thought it would be great if we could apply this to the Phytophthora research. And so what we do in the lab on a really simple basis is we set up slides on, under a microscope and we have a pond of these zoospores and we put in small glass capillaries, they're about the size of a pencil lead, filled with whatever we want to test. And some of it we want to test individual chemicals um, and then also we want to test plant extracts. And I'll show you some of our initial results, and this is a little bit hard to look at, I think. Um, but these are these glass capillaries facing upwards. And what you can see is if they're attracted to something, they'll swim from the pond into the capillary. If they're not attracted, they just keep swimming around in the environment happily. And what we can see is in our empty control, there's no spores in the capillary. You can see in our cowrie root extract, there's quite a few spores. And then the other ones are sort of every now and then you get a random spore swimming in by accident, but there's not a strong attraction. So what we think this says is that there's actually something specific in cowrie that these spores are seeking out. And so I should also the caveat, we just started this project in January. So in scientific terms, this is the blink of a hat. So this is as far as we've gotten. But what we want to see is if we can identify the chemical signal that these spores are attracted to in cowrie trees. And also, are all cowrie trees the same? You know, are there some that are naturally resistant or less attractive and therefore possibly less prone to infection? And we also want to look at what other native plants might be able to give off chemicals that attract or repel zoospores. And I think this could be an advantage I could think of lots of different ways of applying this. Um, you know, instead of just sort of blanketing something with a chemical, we might be able to move to something more like co-planting of a native plant in a cowrie forest that's at risk. Um, we could also think of things like Sandy was talking about today with insects, where it's sort of more, more like a pheromone trap, where you lure the spores away from an environment or put something that they really don't like the smell of to keep them from transitioning into an uninfected forest. And of course, the problem is there's 7,000-ish native plants in New Zealand, and I have no idea where to begin. And I can't test anywhere near that number of plants. You know, we could maybe in a lab test 5 to 10. And so this is, I think, I mean, I think this is a much more promising approach than where I started screening chemical libraries. Um, but I don't have the knowledge with my training to do this. I think we've done a good job of establishing a pipeline. So if somebody is willing to collaborate with us, I think we can go into the lab and relatively efficiently figure out if these things have potential or not. And I do think we need, we need to work quickly because cowrie dieback disease is spreading and the trees are dying. Um, so what I'm hoping from this project is that in collaboration, um, using Mataranga Māori as a foundation for selecting out of this vast diversity here in New Zealand, what are the things that will help us protect the cowrie trees? Um, so what we're hoping over the rest of this project is in the next one and a half years is to identify these chemical signals and to test whether these plant-derived compounds can attract or repel the zoospores and move this from my in vitro tests in the lab into actual soil trials. And that's in collaboration with Amanda that spoke earlier today. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to thank the people involved in the work. Obviously, Amanda has been, I don't know where she's 
hiding now. Um, but she's been a fantastic collaborator, and she's really smart, and she's really hardworking, and she's given me a ton of useful advice. Uh, Scott and Lottie are researchers in my laboratory. Um, Scott's a scientist, and Lottie is a master's student, just started her second year. And I also do want to acknowledge Scion and their Healthy Trees, Healthy Future program, because they got us started on this project. They gave us all the protocols to grow phytophthora in the lab and all of the strains, and of course, the funding to do all this. And also, I mean, this is my whole lab group um, and all the other people that pay my salary so I get to go to work every day. Um, this was our Christmas party. We played Zorb soccer. It was awesome. Um, but yeah, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much. OK, how about I kill her? Monica, do we have any hepatai? I have a question then. So we need to make the Cody trees smell bad, right? <laughs> that would be one approach, yeah. Okay. Um, I, the thing I'm wondering, and this might be a dumb question, but are, no we, are we doing anything to take Cody and you know, grow them in a protected environment so that, they're, so that we've got a supply, if you like, that's not susceptible to the Cody dieback disease? Or is that a dumb question? It's not a dumb question. I mean, I think that's some of the work that Scion is doing around tree breeding. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think there's anything like the equivalent of the offshore reserves for birds, you know, designed for carry. I hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, couple of children. Anyone else have a question for Dr. Monica Gerth before? Yes. Yeah. If you manage to find the signals, or perhaps perhaps a plant that's particularly antagonistic, how do you think that might be applied in the field, in the forest, to help with the control or the suppression of the phytophthora? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends a little bit on what we find, and we don't actually know yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think one of the first things would be localized containment. You know, if you've got a sick tree on your property and you don't want it to infect the rest of the trees, that would be something we could handle. Soil drenching in that area around the tree um, might help. I mean, a big problem also with these, with the life cycle of Phytophthora is also getting them to break dormancy. They sort of go into hibernation and they're really resistant to everything we throw at them when they're in hibernation. If we could find a chemical signal that get, get, attracts them out of hibernation so then we can wallop them, that would be really handy. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think longer term, if we could find, a, for instance, a native plant here in New Zealand that produced naturally exuded a repellent and Plants are constantly exuding chemicals into the environment. You know, maybe that's just something that, particularly in border forests, you know, if you've got an infected and an uninfected area, maybe you plant, you know, a, a row of manuka, for instance. Fatai um. <coughs> No. Okay. Kapai. Kia ora, Monica. Ngā mahi nui kia koe. Ko mai te Monica Dew.